Okay. All right. Welcome everyone to the September 28th, 2022 uh, PSTSC's meeting. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, I see a few share requests coming in from the notes documents. So I'll just, uh, I'll do this when I get to them, people. Um, okay. So for today, we have uh, Keith uh, Bechtel has kindly agreed to present on uh, science validation and verification. Um, so I would like to set aside maybe 10 minutes at the end of the hour for some other discussion, but um, unless there are any questions or comments, um, I think we can move on to, to uh, Keith's presentation. So I'll pause for a sec to ask if anybody has any questions that are not about the live notes document. Okay, uh, seeing and hearing none, um, it's a pleasure to introduce Keith uh, Bechtel, who will talk to us about science verification validation. Um, Keith's slides are linked in a live notes document, but I will also copy the link uh, here into the into the uh, chat here. Looks like, yep, there we go. Um, without further ado, Keith, would you like to present to us? Great, uh, thanks Will. Uh, so, so I'm Keith Bechtel, I'm the Rubin Observatory System Verification and Validation Scientist. Uh, I'll talk about system level science verification validation and also a few words about in-kind contributions since I think that's, that's related and people may be interested. Um, so let's, uh, so in terms of the content, uh, what I've done here is that I've tried to take a best guess about this very large topic about what people might be interested in and where to drill down. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the scope and deliverables. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about data analysis tooling, on-sky observing strategy. Um, I won't say too much about the Oxtel Imaging Survey, uh, but you can find uh, some uh, examples of the analyses that we're doing in the backup slides. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the organization of the system level science verification validation effort, and then a bit about the sitcom in kind contribution status so in general, the way that this is organized is that I'll, there'll be different sections and in each one of the section headers, you'll see links to, to relevant backup slides. So the first topic here is the scope and deliverables. So let's start with the big picture. So the, the core questions that we're trying to address uh, is have, you know, is the as-built system capable of routinely acquiring the raw pixel level data that will support the science goals of the 10 year LSST survey. And at the most basic level, you can think about this as the, the optical throughput, the delivered image quality, and your capability to calibrate the data. Uh, this is in, in some sense what determines whether the raw pixels are going to be usable um, across the, the 10 year survey. And to do that, we need to understand this distribution of data quality and specifically how the hardware, software, and the observatory operations together contribute to, to generating the science-ready data products. Um, so that's what, that's what we're moving towards is a, is a science-grade observatory where we can pick any altitude azimuth command, take the data, process it, and know in close to real time whether we are taking science-grade quality images. So in terms of the, the definitions to, to talk about the scope in a little bit more detail, uh, there's verification, uh, which is you know, basically asking, you know, is the as-built product meeting the specifications? And this is what defines our criteria for construction completeness and uh, entering operations. There's also uh, validation and characterization, uh, which will begin during the commissioning period, but will continue throughout the full 10 years of LSST operations and beyond. So this is getting more at the questions of, you know, what science can you do with the data products? Is it meeting the expectations of users? And do we understand in detail how the observatory works? So to get to the next level of, of concreteness, uh, we have a list of deliverables that we are preparing uh, to have ready for the operations readiness review that marks this transition between uh, construction and the, and the start of the 10-year LSST survey. So the first of these in a, in a formal sense is, a, is the verified set of system level requirements from our top level uh, system 
uh, requirements documents. This is the LSST system requirements and the observatory system specifications, the LSR and the OSS that are linked here. Uh, there's something like 100 to 200 normative science performance requirements. Uh, I indicate a range here because there's some overlap between the documents in terms of the flow down. And also some of the requirements have multiple different individual uh, aspects of the science performance that they are quantifying. Um, so there's a bit of a range, but it gives a sense for the scope of what we're trying to do. So for each one of those, we need to have the detailed specifications, our test plans and reports, and then our final compliance status. We also need to understand what are the impacts in the case of a non-compliance. The next major set of deliverables is the documented set of all the science verification and validation analysis software that is ready to be handed over to operations so that you know, during the 10-year survey, uh, we know uh, that we're taking good quality data. There's also a set of uh, studies to inform LSST operations that uh, would benefit from having on-sky data to, to do the testing. So these include correlating the science performance with the, uh, with the system telemetry. Uh, it's determining the number of visits uh, that are needed for template generation for difference imaging. Uh, a dithering strategy for the wide, fast, deep, and deep drilling fields, uh, and a visit definition in the sense of should we be taking two by 15 seconds uh, snap exposures or a single 30 second exposure? Um, those are just some examples. Uh, I see a hand from Katrin. I, I just have a very quick question um, for clarification. So, the verified system level requirements, those are already written up, and you have a list of what you will deliver, right? Is the same true for the science verification and validation, or is there still um, room for the science collaborations to provide input, um, do you know what I'm saying? For the, for the science validation, there is a wide range of possibility here. Uh, we will try to get as far as we can during commissioning, but having some sense of the priorities from the community is really, is really valuable. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're attempting to do that through the in-kind contribution programs is one way to address that. Great, thank you. Yeah. So All other right. deliverables are drafts of, oh. oh Sorry, I was lower raising my hand, but so you link the uh, verify system level requirements documents, you mentioned a documented set of science verification and validation. Um, is there a document associated to that? Is there oh, somewhere for we the, can for the, see what they are now to see if we want to augment them with science collaboration specific requests? Right. So uh, the LSR and the OSS, that's the place to go to see our, our, our normative requirements. For many of those requirements, there's actually some considerable scientific thought that's needed to develop the methodology to measure them. For example, it's one thing to say that you will you know, measure the absolute photometry you know, to an AB magnitude scale and, you know, physical units, having a methodology for doing that is, you know, you could write a whole, a whole paper about this. So we're planning to have uh, a supplemental document that will capture the more detailed algorithmic descriptions of how we are interpreting and how we've implemented the tests for these science requirements. And it hasn't been decided yet whether that document will also include definitions for science validation studies that we plan to do or whether those will be captured uh, elsewhere. Leanne may want to comment more here. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Keith. Um, just to add to what Keith is saying um, and to, to maybe address Kathleen and um, Ted's case questions about the verification requirements, these performance requirements, I don't think at this stage we'd want to augment or change any of these formal performance requirements that are in our documents with requirements coming from the community. However, we do envisage that the tools we're building will be able to uh, will be able to be used to implement additional metrics in a similar way to what math is for implementing me metrics about this, the survey cadence, that you can also come along with definitions of additional science performance metrics, implement them in the system that we've developed, add them to our dashboards that you can use to track them and and uh, you know be able to see those and visualize these in the same way as for the formal metrics that are in our requirements that we need to verify. I'll, I'll talk a, in a bit more detail about how, how that, the process for how that could happen um, in later slides. Okay. 
Uh, so we also have as part of our deliverables is drafts of construction papers. So these would be, you know, papers that could go to uh, a journal that describe at a, you know, at, at high level, the, the overall delivered uh, performance of the ESBELT system. Uh, this could also be supplemented by additional tech notes that go into more detail. And then there are press images um, to, to share how exciting our data is with the, with the general public. Okay, so next section here is on the data analysis tooling that we're building. So one of the points to emphasize is that the majority of the science performance analyses that we are planning to implement uh, will be run automatically as part of the science pipelines in the sense that basically you can think about it as, as an additional step of the data processing that once you have the data products, you basically do a, a set of, of studies on them and you compute a set of both metric values and diagnostic plots. These are persisted alongside the input data products. And that way you have this direct correspondence between the data products and the, and the quality attributes. So this is all being built into uh, all of the middleware and science pipelines uh, infrastructure. During the past year, we've, uh, we've done some refactoring of that analysis software to uh, basically better integrate uh, the metric and plot generation capabilities into more fully leverage the, uh, the generation three middleware that you may have heard about um, the science pipelines is using um, and trying to make all of this uh, tooling more modular uh, so that many developers can work in parallel. Um, and so the, the product of this is a, is a Python package uh, called analysis tools. Um, you can think about it as a refactor of some of the, the previous tooling, um, Faro and analysis DRP, if, if you've heard of those before. Um, this slide is showing an example uh, visualization that's, that's produced by this package uh, using hypersuprime cam data as a, as a, as a test case. Um, in this case, it's looking at uh, ellipticity residuals. And one of the key points to make is that with this um, newly refactored uh, package, you get uh, both the, the, the plot that's shown, uh, you get uh, metric values that are associated with this, that are stored with the same data ID and are persisted alongside the input data. And also you can easily uh, reconstitute the input data such that if you were to look at this plot or see a metric value and you wanted to dig deeper, you could easily get all of the input data products that went into generating this plot and basically have them um, in memory in a, in a notebook very quickly. Um, so we shared an example notebook uh, to demonstrate this capability at the, at the PCW back, back in August, and there's a link here. Once we have the- Oh, yeah, I see uh, one, one very quick question, and I'm just curious. So suppose you run during the night, right? How many of these plots will you produce? Do you, do you have an idea? Like that hasn't been decided yet. Uh, the number of plots is likely to be overwhelming. And mm -hmm. so we think that our standard procedure will be to focus on the metric values because that's, uh, you know, you can compute a metric value per, per visit or per, uh, per sensor or um, per co-ad tract, for example. And then once you have that distribution of metrics, you have a better sense of where to drill down. So it might be that we're generating the plots more on an ad hoc basis when, when we want to do the drill down studies. Uh, the exact workflow hasn't been decided yet, but we wanted to make sure that we were building an infrastructure that would allow us to do both with the same tooling to ensure consistency. Thanks. Keith, I think the question was during the night, because that's what I heard from Katrine. So the on the look on the mountain QA is something that you're probably coming to later, which is a subset. Uh, yes, that's right. Process. And I see a hand from Leanne as well. Yeah, so I think it's mostly been covered by, through your response, actually. But maybe just to add to, to, add to what you said, um, th there, are, there are thousands of plots that get, get generated. And I think, um, uh, for me, the most exciting part of this and bringing it together is, is enabling drill down, on the, on the fly interactive drill down. So you look at a distribution of metric values. You don't say, what plot will I look at today and then start to scan through hundreds of plots and look for an issue. That's just never going to scale. The pipelines team generate a lot of plots to help them with their analysis and their work. They, they generate PDFs and put them into the Butler repo. But I think when you're doing this in, in real observing, you want to look at distribution of metric values, as Keith says, say, oh, here's a bit of an anomaly. I want to click on this. You want some sort of interactive interface that allows you to then drill down, pull up the data IDs that go to everything behind it, and then start interactive, you know, generating plots and interacting with these things. You know, 
And that's that's where I see the power of bringing this together to have the you know behind the metrics we can then access the data sets that we used to to collapse down to a metric value. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think I think a lot of these questions are are sort of you know leading into okay you know how do, how how do we actually use this information? Um, so this is this is one slide that gives an example of one of the uh, dashboards that we use for monitoring data quality. Um, this is uh, this is an example where we take a small subset of Hypersa Prime Cam data and we reprocess it uh, every night uh, so that you can see uh, when you've made some sort of change to the science pipelines, what impact that has on the data products. Um, so right now we're using it to monitor the development of the science pipelines, but during commissioning, instead of having a fixed unit of data and changing the science pipelines, we'll actually be having you know, new data that's coming in um, every night. Um, Leanne is the, is the first author on, a, on an archive paper that, that describes uh, this in a bit more detail. Um, we also have uh, a set of uh, tools that we're building up that could be used to help visualize all these plots. And so uh, this is a screenshot of, um, of a plot navigator that's in development where if you're persisting uh, both the metric values and the diagnostic plots in the same uh, Butler repository, uh, this would be an easy interface to, um, uh, to basically pull these up and, and, and get some more diagnostic information. So one of the, one of the uh, positive uh, features of this uh, package is that it's part of the science pipelines and it's all being developed open source. And so we are envisioning that both uh, you know, the, the members of the Rubin Observatory staff in-kind contributors um, and potentially others from the science community uh, could be making you know, pull requests and adding uh, both metrics and plots uh, to this package. It's, again, it's all designed to be very modular. And this is one of the more direct ways that science collaborations could have an influence on science verification and validation prior to a major data release, because we will be running these analyses as part of our standard uh, pipeline processing. And that means that we could actually be looking at some of these diagnostics on prototypes of data releases. And also if there are important metrics that the community is very interested in, then you could have those QA values that are calculated um, and that are released as, as part of the, the data release process. Um, so that you would, have, you would have access to these metrics and plots. Um, Excuse me, Keith. I see two hands up here. Yeah. Meg, I think, and then Mario. I wanted to ask about the if we think back to math, most people didn't write metrics because they're not funded to and they don't have time because they're not funded to. So do we expect with the same scenario of people aren't funded to do this, are they gonna have time to actually learn your system to be able to do a pull request? Because that was sort of the expectation with math, and I would say is that never reached, I think the expectation that was that the community would be able to, I think, and that really was because of lack of funding and therefore time to be able to do it or to be able to hire someone, right, to devote their time to it. So is that gonna be an issue here in terms of science verification validation of, if somebody wanted something in the community, we wouldn't really be able to implement that into this metric system. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because that's the first thing that sort of comes to my mind is what's the lesson learned from sort of math um, and how does that apply here? Maybe it doesn't, maybe this would be very different as you're thinking about this in terms of, uh, you know, future data releases when people are paid to do science and maybe this goes under that. But I was just wondering if you could touch a little bit on that. Sure. So, I mean, what I would say here is that we are developing this with within the Rubin Observatory because we need it to, to do the science verification validation work to, uh, to go through commissioning and to support steady state operations. So we need this as an internal tool, but we have made intentional decisions when designing this package to do it in a way that would allow um, other individuals to be able to contribute. So we, we've tried not to close that door I think the degree to which this happens in practice, I think that's above, above my level, but from a technical standpoint, we're doing everything we can to make it possible.
I see a question from Mario and then Fed. Yeah, I, I, mine's a quick one. Uh, the, the the plot navigator you showed in the previous slide, is that part of analysis tools or how can how can one try it out? The way so the way to think about this is that uh, analysis tools would be creating static PNG plots that are persisted in the Butler and then could be pulled up with the with the plot navigator. So it it, it is not providing this web interface, but it provides the content that's being displayed. And, and the, the code itself, sorry, I should have been clearer. The, the code itself, like if I wanted to try it out, is the code itself part of the analysis tools package or, or is it somewhere else? That's that's right. So the, the, the code that takes, for example, the source catalogs or object catalogs and then produces the plot that's being displayed here, that's in analysis tools. So you could, uh, you could go to that tutorial notebook that was linked on a preceding slide, and you could get you know some some flavor for how this works. Um, and it's al it's already being used by the science pipelines and verification validation teams and internally within the project. And, and, and there's a there's a way to launch this web UI from from that code. That's right. Um, maybe Leanne wants to comment on on the the status of that. Um, yes. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, uh, Mario, this is, or at least it has been uh, up until recently deployed on the IDF. We've been using it there to look at some plots that have been coming out of the DP2 processing. Whether it's still up and running or not, I'm not sure, but I will find out for you. And I'll try to get it running again. I know it's sort of been up and down a bit. Keith, I didn't think this code was in the same GitHub repository as analysis tools. In fact, I've just had a quick look and um, I'm pretty sure it's not. It's in LSS TDM Pipe Task Plot Navigator. The app itself to, to deploy the app that runs this is, is not part of analysis tools, but it does connect underneath it to a Butler repo. Unless there's been more refactoring that I'm not up to date with. You might. Oh, uh, sorry, that, that was what that was what I intended. Maybe, maybe uh, what I said was unclear, but the what I what I meant to say is that the whole plot navigator, all that infrastructure is not part of analysis tools. No, it's what not. actually what actually produces the, the PNG that's being displayed is part of analysis tools. Right. So, so, thanks. Uh, I, I don't want to take up more time. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to follow up uh, offline and figure I'll, out where Larry, we're I'll, going. I'll check the repo. But it's definitely a different repo for the app. So I think where you're going is that you want to deploy this app, maybe, and play with it. But anyway, I'll, I'll find out those details for you. Good. Um, yes, I actually wanted to amplify Meg's question about uh, the expectation from the community and highlight a risk, which is that, you know, the risk of the imbalance, the scientific imbalance of the feedback they are going to get if we don't mitigate the resources imbalance. And so the specific question is, if people want to contribute code and metrics, who do they talk to to learn how to integrate them in your software? So I think one of the failure points for the maths was that we underestimated the, need, the needed amount of training. So right now, I would say that there's a border, maybe two dozen people on the project who have, you know, who, who are familiar enough with this tool that they would be able to provide support. Uh, through the in-kind contribution program, uh, that number may rise to, you know, do dozens more, you know, potentially a hundred more people who would be familiar. Uh, we did have a full set of documentation um, for basically a, a previous, you know, so we've done this recent refactoring we had a full set of documentation for the, the previous tooling, FARA, which, which would, could be refreshed. Um, and we have example notebooks. I could easily see um, the, the notebooks being expanded into something that could be included in the, uh, in the set of uh, tutorials that are used with the data previews. Um, so for example, I've, I've contributed to notebooks like that in the past, and the, those have been part of the the, the data preview uh, delegates, you know, have, have the standard set of courses that, that's available. Um, so I think we have a couple different strategies for how, how to document and to expand the number of users. Um, my guess is that Leanne has, has more to add here as well. 
Mm, no, I don't have any more red unless there's anything specific. Sorry, I didn't lower my hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was an old so, hand. Thank I you. I really it. appreciate it. I encourage you to think totally about how you communicate this to the com to the community so that you know they have points of contact and they don't overwhelm you with questions asked to the wrong person and things like that. Uh, I see a hand from Meg. I think the other risk is that people don't engage at all. And so then you've only heard for one group. So DESK is very nicely funded. And so I can imagine that they will develop lots of things for you and solar system won't. And so one of the things is gonna be how do you manage the fact that some communities might, right? Maybe they're not nicely funded, but they're funded in a way that's different because they have funded for pre-operations where many other science areas have not. I'll clarify that point, right? So we know from past history that DESK has participated very closely Right, for example, is one representative who's been able to get pre-operations funding for their research. So my worry is, is that how are how are you going to make sure you tap into those other groups in terms of feedback? Because if there's lots of, of metrics for dark energy science and none for solar system because they're not engaged in TP0 very much because there are no solar system objects in there. So that's not a great avenue for our community to learn. How is that going to be managed? And it might be something to think about. You might not have an answer now, but that's my worry is that you'll hear from one group very significantly and others not. And so maybe that's okay because these are all second order effects. But I think just explaining to the community how these additional contributions get interpreted or weighted um, may be useful because it may be that other areas will not be able to catch up as quickly because of the way funding's, you know, pre pre-start of science data flowing, you know, funding is not equally distributed, right? Um, and so it's just something to think about because I think in past, right, there's been a lot of interaction between those areas that have because they're able to push specifically. Um, and so I just think whatever, whatever you decide to do, you may think about how to clearly describe how those things will be used and what to do when those other areas may not reach up to the point to make any metrics. Maybe that's okay. But I think explaining, making sure the community understands that so they don't feel like they've been, their voice wasn't heard because they couldn't muster that in the time frame to, to contribute. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that uh, um, just to reemphasize re the point that I was making before, that this is primarily being developed as, a, as an internal tool to meet the needs of, of Rubin Observatory to, to produce the data products that we need. And I, I, I definitely hear the concern. I recognize it. I also don't think this is a zero sum game. I think all the contributions that we're getting will help to improve the data products um, and basically, you know, is, is you know, we, we, we basically like appreciate all, all these contributions. So we, we, we welcome them and uh, we, we will work with, with yeah, you know, individuals as we can. Steve? Yeah, if I could just quickly, um, I, I think we should move forward with the presentation. I think we hear the concern very clearly, so thank you, very clear, eloquently um, uh, stated. Um, I, at the risk of feeding a fed horse, I will just say, this has a very short amount of time, the, this phase, and it has very specific needs for validation and verification, and that is the primary focus of, of this aspect. But I think the messaging uh, about this component of it to the science collaborations, uh, we, we understand the feedback here. So thank you. Okay, I will move on. Okay, so just to uh, uh, wrap up the discussion about uh, the tooling, one point that I think is important to emphasize is that when we think about the data quality analysis, we're, we're thinking on multiple different timescales. One of the timescales is uh, minutes in the sense that we are getting close to real-time feedback that would inform nighttime operations. We also have science analyses that are running on the time scale of hours that is helping us to prioritize day-to-day -day work 
and uh, during commissioning will be used to help optimize the system configuration um, and gives us an in basically gives us the inputs to start thinking about how to do template generation and building co ads. And then there's a time scale beyond 24 hours, which is where we're we're doing the the multi epoch processing in terms of you know co ads, uh, templates, uh, preparing to do difference imaging, and where we're doing deep dive into the performance of the science uh, pipeline algorithms, uh, as well as generating the verif you know the verification artifacts. So I just want people to be aware that we're actually thinking about analyses that are running on all these different time scales uh, during the commissioning period. So one of our highest priorities uh, in the next year, and this, this gets much more technical, so I, I won't dwell on it, is that we're basically trying to stand up all of the infrastructure uh, so that we can do this near real-time processing. And if, if people are interested in discussing further, I'm happy to go, go into the details of that, but I'll, I'll press on in the interest of time. Okay, so the next uh, topic here is on-sky observation strategy during commissioning. So I'm looking at the time and trying, we had, we had much more discussion than I was planning to. Um, so I'm trying to decide what to prioritize here. Um, I'll, try to give a, I'll try to give an overview and then we can, we can drill down a bit if people are interested. So one point to make uh, is just to help manage expectations. Uh, during the commissioning period, we have a very short period of time and we're trying to uh, uh, do something very challenging in the, uh, with, you know, with a lot of different moving parts. So we, as a Rubin Observatory, need to prioritize the technical and scientific verification of the requirements and demonstrate that we have you know, met the construction completeness uh, requirements and are ready to go into LSST operations. So we will try to take data in a way that allows as broad science validation studies as possible. And we have a strategy for, for how to do that. Um, ultimately, a subset of the data products from the commissioning on sky observations will be made available um, as part of data preview one and data preview two. So one of the strategies that we've been using to try to get community input um, was uh, uh, requesting uh, this set of commissioning notes. Um, so this was circa 2020. Uh, we took input um, from uh, many science collaborations, and we've been incorporating that input into, into our planning. Um, I will say that already several of the suggested fields are on a target list that is being uh, routinely observed with the Oxtel. So it's basically, we're already exercising our ability to, to take this input and to design observations. Um, as we are getting closer to on-sky observations with ComCam, we will be producing a menu of candidate target fields, and there may be further iteration with the community to refine the exact pointing, um, uh, at, least, at least for those suggestions. So some of the uh, emergent themes that came out of those commissioning notes is that um, if, you, if you look across the, the, you know, the breadth of ideas that came from the different science collaborations, um, one of the one of the topics that appeared over and over again uh, was this idea of having data sets that would serve as a, as a reference for characterizing the wide, fast, deep survey. And so the ideal data set for this would be deep and ideally um, deeper than the 10 year LSST wide, fast, deep equivalent exposure. Uh, it would have a fast cadence uh, so that you have a dense sampling of temporal events. Um, and this would span over several hours to, to you know, several consecutive nights. You, uh, you would want to have as broad band coverage as possible to enable a broad range of science topics. And you uh, would ideally want uh, uh, data that has some uniform depth or homogeneity to it. Um, so it turns out that many of these goals can be met with a set of LSST CAM pointings with something like 1,000 to 2,000 visits uh, in multiple bands with dense temporal sampling. Um, so we've uh, it turns out that this is the same data set that's actually very useful on the project side for a lot of the uh, system optimization studies. And so um, this is one of the highest priority uh, observations that we're planning to take during the on-sky commissioning phase. Uh, so here's a look at the major future milestones to give a sense of how much time is currently being planned uh, for the on-sky observations. 
Um, so this is a this is an entry point uh, to our uh, planning for the activities that, that we want to un undertake uh, during the on-sky commissioning period. Um, one of the points, one of the dates to point out is the system, uh, it's called System First Light uh, in March 2024 in the current schedule. Uh, one point to make here is that when we say first light in our internal uh, milestones, this is not literally the first photons on the camera, uh, but is representing when we've achieved uh, science grade image quality uh, delivered over the full field of view. And this is ComCam, right? This is system ComCam first light. This is system first light with LSST cam. Uh, engineering first light with ComCam would be July 2023 in the current okay. schedule. Um, so in general, I'll try to avoid this terminology in this talk because um, it could, is potentially confusing for external audiences, but this is how these milestones are referred to internally within the project. Uh, this is a detailed schedule, which I'll, I'll skip in the interest of time. Um, I think this uh, summary schematic may be, may be more useful. Uh, so there's, this is a sort of a one slide summary of our plans for commissioning data collection. There's two tracks here. So there's a track with ComCam that showed in the upper half of the slide and a track with LSST cam that's shown in the, in the lower half. So, with both ComCam and LSST cam, there's a similar uh, set of phasing of the types of data that we can collect and the types of science verification validation studies that, that we're doing at different points in commissioning as our understanding of the system matures. So it starts with electro-optical testing on level three, which is, a, which is actually a staging area before the, uh, the camera goes onto the main telescope. Then there's a period where uh, the camera is, is mounted on the telescope and we can uh, do a full set of calibrations. Uh, this is the in-dome engineering period where the timeline starts getting uh, you know, very structured is when you get to these uh, on-sky engineering periods. So these start with some very basic electro-optical testing and then transition into uh, the first type of images that may start to approach science quality. So these are some of the pointing tests and where we are testing the um, open loop active optic system. Uh, during this period, we also plan to take uh, observations um, in the sense of star flats where you're doing dithered observations um, in a dense star field. Uh, and we can use this as a, as a check of our internal uh, calibration of, of the consistency and response across the focal plane. Where, where is the first light in these diagrams? So the, let me go, I think it, uh, okay, so the first light, the way that we've, the way that we've defined it right. on project uh, is that the first light milestone is that this transition between on-sky engineering and system optimization. And again, this is, this is the delivery of, of science grade imaging over the full field of view. Uh, first photons on the camera is happening uh, several weeks earlier at the start of the on-sky engineering period. I see a hand from one, one, one very quick question. So DP1 would then happen after ComCam was removed. It's basically just the, the give the data to the community. <laughs> That's right. So, so at some point there's a there's a juncture where we have to decide to remove ComCam from the telescope so that we can begin putting in all the infrastructure uh, to put LSST cam on. And so once we have finished the on-sky observations with ComCam, then it that's basically all that data will be processed in a in a uniform way and then uh, released as as data preview one. In data preview two would include all the observations uh, up through and including the science validation surveys. So there's, uh, with LSST cam, it's the same set of activities, uh, except for that once we reach the end of the system optimization, then we enter this period of the science validation surveys, which you can think of as uh, sort of this transition and handoff between uh, the construction and the operations. 
where by the end of the science validation surveys, we, we would be ready to begin the 10-year LSST survey. Uh, Leanne. Yeah, I just want to add a, a small point to Kathleen's question before about DP1. Um, not sure that everyone always appreciates this. As we go through and take the commissioning data with, with ComCam, uh, we will be processing that data every night and possibly every night with different versions of the science pipelines as we find bugs, as we fix things, as we change things. And this will be used to serve commissioning needs. But when we get to the end of that period, we have our commissioning data set. We will stop, we will table that data. We will then produce a release of the science pipelines, including all the fixes, all the changes we have today, and then reprocess everything with one version. And it's that reprocessed version with one fixed version of the science pipelines that becomes DP1. And likewise, mm -hmm. DP2. Okay. So let me let me go on. So one way to think about the sequence of science verification validation activities is that we have this, a general process of trying to move forward as many of the verification uh, studies in time as possible, so that from the first time we're taking in focus images with ComCam, we are intending to push the data through the science pipelines produce source catalogs uh, and run, uh, run science verification analyses on these. Um, and then we gradually build in complexity from there. So the first, so you know, one way to think about the, you know, sort of the structuring of science verification validation is that there are some aspects of the data quality that are effectively fixed by the hardware. They're set by the telescope, the camera, and by our observing strategy. Uh, these are the things that are the hardest to change. There's also aspects of the uh, science performance that can be continually improved through changes in the science pipelines. So when we're thinking about how to structure our activities during this you know, very tight period for the, for the commissioning science verification validation, what we want to do is prioritize those aspects that are, that are mostly fixed by the hardware um, as the first, first aspects of data quality that we're checking. So this is uh, the image quality, the system throughput, uh, ghosts and scattered light, uh, sky brightness and readout noise on the camera, detector anomalies. Uh, we think of checking off these basic aspects of the science performance as our threshold for, for beginning the system optimization. Um, and this is that first light milestone that we've talked about before. The next level of sophistication and the questions that we can ask has to deal with the uh, calibratability of the data in the sense that we can do the full set of instrument signature removal, uh, that we can check our visit level PSF modeling, and that we have an internally consistent photometric and astrometric calibration. And this is our threshold for saying that we are confident that we have a science grade observatory that is uh, you know, capable of routinely delivering raw pixel level data that will be useful for LSST. Uh, during uh, the science validation uh, surveys, uh, we have an opportunity to go further. We have an opportunity to look at uh, the co-addition, difference imaging, uh, deep blending, galaxy photometry, uh, et cetera. And we will try to get as far as we can on these studies uh, in time for the operations readiness review. Uh, but these are also topics that will be you know, continuously investigated throughout LSST. And, and so th this is where we get into this distinction between science verification and, and validation. Keith, I'm gonna jump in for a second. Um, it's, it's very nearly 10 till the hour. Um, so we're running, running a little bit low on time. Um, if you have any sort of particular key messages you'd like to get across to the science collaborations in the next few minutes, um, now might be a good time to do it. I think what would be most productive, so there's close to 100 slides in the slide deck. Um, it's intended to be a reference. We've had mm -hmm. a lot of discussion and I, I was hoping that this would trigger discussion. Uh, so I, I, I see this has <clears throat> been, been useful. Um, if there, I think probably what's most useful is to pause and see if there's any questions that people have about science verification and about the in-kind contribution program. And we can, we can you know, focus on those in the few minutes that remain.
um, but the slides uh, should be you know, a, a reference uh, that people can use for finding more information. I'm happy to talk about any of these things in a lot more detail. We could talk about these things for, for hours. Keith, you have access to the live notes document, don't you? So if, if participants have questions that occur to them after this meeting or that will require more time than we have to discuss it. Can they add them to the uh, the live notes document and sure that would, be, that, that would be fine. Yeah, if and, and will if you could if you could uh, you know ping me. <laughs> um, if, yeah, sure. If, you know, if you happen to see sort of a a, a number of questions arise, uh, I'm happy to talk about this more. There's there's a there's an enormous amount of detail that that we could get into and. Um, I think it's just a matter of knowing what what the community is most interested in discussing. Okay, there is a comment in the chat here from from uh, Meg here. It would be good to know the communication plan on how to um, when and in what way successful milestones will be communicated. Um, have the planners reached that level of detail yet? Uh, well, maybe I can answer that. Um, seeing as I'm the commissioning scientist and poor Keith is the verification. In fact, we work together incredibly closely, so I wouldn't worry about that split. <clears throat> I think the answer is no. Um, it's a good point, and we should think about how we're going to make appropriate information available. Remember, the data is not public, but WST data wasn't public either. That is, it's not, it's not project public, it's commissioning team and people who have been inducted into the commissioning team public. But it's a good point. As far as I know, we haven't thought about it yet. I see Keith's I mean, hands up. I, I would say that one answer to this is that we have a communications team and they've been putting a lot of work into providing updates throughout the construction process. So every, every week, there, you know, there's there's a digest of the recent activities and integration milestones, and I expect that during commissioning, there will be similar, you know, similar updates. Um, in terms of the data itself, what we are, what we yeah. haven't settled on a detailed policy yet, but we have been discussing the the option of Using the using the tech notes that individuals may be familiar with as a way of documenting work in progress as as we are looking at the commissioning data and having a record that is um, you know publicly visible of of you know the, the technical status of the observatory and also using the LSST community forum as as a way of of sharing sharing updates so we do have some mechanisms for doing this. Uh, but the detailed policy on exactly what can be shared has is is to be determined. It will be what will be publicly shared prior to the data previews will most likely be the derived data products as they're defined in the Rubin data policy, um, because the the data previews are the mechanism for making the the pixel level data available and the associated data products that would appear in the Butler. Okay, thank you. Well, we're coming up on, on five to the hour now. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So let's uh, all thank Keith again for opening Pandora's box for us and uh, starting a much, much bigger topic than I think we could possibly cover in one hour. So thank you very much, Keith, uh, for the presentation and for your patience. Um, a couple of items of, of business for science collaboration shows. Um, uh, Regarding the questions for uh, for Jenny for the Catalyst Fellowship, you will see this in the live notes document as well. Um, I plan to send the questions to Jenny uh, tomorrow afternoon, so please do, if you haven't already, um, send in questions onto the Google Doc. Um, you will see listed in the live notes the uh, the topics of which myself, Steve, and Fed are aware of for future 
uh, future meetings like this and as a form that you can use to request topics. Um, we would like to try to organize a block of these meetings in one go, so please stay tuned for updates. And then the final point I'd like to mention, um, just so that folks know about it, is that for future meetings, uh, there will be a section in the um, in the live notes agenda for pre-meeting questions to help us sort of focus the discussion um, when the meeting takes place. Uh, that will require that I get the agenda up earlier in future meetings, which I will, I will endeavour to do. But please do keep an eye out for those. Um, okay, so that's all I had to discuss. I see Steve's hand is up. So, yeah, just, Steve, just do you have following a comment? on, Will, thanks. Um, yeah, we want to make these useful and productive and efficient. And in addition to um, uh, having pre-meeting questions to focus uh, attention, for uh, topic <clears throat> proposals, it would be very helpful to have a little bit more than just a general title. I think we together are moving beyond the overall status and introductory sort of discussions and uh, into meatier topics. And therefore, um, uh, in order to make progress in a short amount of time, I think we need to focus the goals of a particular session a little bit more in advance if possible. doesn't mean that freewheeling discussion isn't possible. It absolutely is um, a good thing and an important thing. Um, and the feedback is, is always really helpful. Um, but uh, having a little bit better idea of what aspects the science collaboration chairs are specifically interested in in particular topic would very much help us to uh, define uh, session better. So if you can give a little bit more thought to fleshing that out, would be much appreciated. Thank you. To follow on from that, don't be surprised if, if we contact you, if you've suggested a topic for a bit more information um, to, help, to help focus. Thank you for the clarification, Steve. Um, all right, with that, we're now at three minutes to the hour. Are there any more last minute comments or questions anybody has before we draw the meeting to a close? Uh, Leanne? Yeah, um, so I think a little bit of a chat was fed privately just as a follow up to this whole question about the community contributing metrics. And I really want to, I know we said this, but I just want to say it again. We are not asking the community for anything at all. Please don't go away and say we want your metrics. We don't. Now, I also don't want to err too much on the side of go away, we don't want your metrics. It, all input from the community is gratefully appreciated. I think the point we really wanted to communicate was when we designed this tool, extensibility and usability were key design goals because we were really looking into the future that someone might come along and say, hey, you know, I've got this idea for metric, can we implement that? And we can go away and do it. And we've seen this happen across our team, across the broader part of the, the DM team who weren't the key developers of this tool. So, um, Whilst you know we appreciate all of the community, I just want to say we don't need anything. This was developed for our own verification purposes. We're not coming and asking you for anything. Please don't go away and 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 say that you know we're looking for stuff from you. I don't want to put these expectations on the community. I know people are underfunded and overworked. But if you do have an idea, just come talk to Keith or me. Thanks, Leanne. I, I may ping you and the Fed after this meeting just to ensure that's accurate in the minutes for this yeah. meeting. Sure. Um, just so we have that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for your patience and your attention. And with that, I'm going to close the meeting. I will stop recording and um, happy Wednesday, everybody. Thank you all. And thanks again to Keith. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everybody.